Hello and welcome to coverage of Grand Prix Louisville. This is the semifinals. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Jacob Van Lunen. And we are off here. First things first, Temple of Deceit, scry something to the bottom. And that is for Brian Bronduin on the left-hand side of your screen there. He is playing Mono Black Devotion against Alex Sittner on the other side, playing Esper Control. So a couple of scry lands here. Anybody who thought that those weren't going to make a big impact in standard has been proven demonstrably wrong as yes. they have <laughs> made their way into many, many decks, including what's virtually a mono black deck. It might actually just be pure mono black for, for BBD. I don't remember if they have any blue mana symbols floating around outside of the specters or whatever. No, they don't have any blue mana symbols. However... So, so are we saying then, then that's a enters of blade tapped swamp uh, for no. the scry ability? What's going because on here? Because he has Nightfell Specter in his deck, so he can attack his opponent and flip up something like a Master of Waves mm. with his Nightfell Specter, and then he can cast that off of his temple. And not only is he casting a Master of Waves from his opponent's deck, but the fact that he has a Nightfell Specter, yeah, he paid three black for it, but he's going to get four elemental tokens out of that. Okay, sweet. All right, so Thoughtseize for Brian Bronduin reveals a couple of Doom Blades, an Aetherling, a Jace, a Sphinx's Revelation, and a Hero's Downfall, I believe. And there's no blue mana in that hand. And there are also two Doom Blades. Wow, no blue mana. No blue mana on the table here for Sittner. <laughs> Three double blue cards. And, and, and those Doom Blades are just completely blank against BBD. Unless, are they playing uh, Muta Vault? <laughs> Yes, they are playing Muta Vault. Okay, so it's not literally blank, but I mean, BBD has to allow a Muta Vault to die, which he doesn't even have on the table right now. So yeah, I think I think Brian has to be reasonably happy seeing this hand. All right, and he is going to peel away a double blue and another double blue spell. So he's just going to work on uh, Sittner's hand here, even though those spells are a long way off from being cast. All right, well now they got just got a lot closer. <laughs> Temple of Deceit. <laughs> First blue mana source, so BBD with the insurance plan on those two thought seizes there. And he doesn't have anything else right now, though. He's just going to keep passing the turn back. Yeah, he would really like to have an Underworld Connections so that he could... Uh, hey, right on yeah, time, he draws an Underworld Connections, and he is going to run it right out there. Only one blue mana symbol, so, well, you know, Syncopate is a possibility here. Actually, he could just pay for Syncopate anyway, so n nothing's going to happen there. It's going to resolve, and he's going to start drawing more and more cards. Underworld Connection is really one of the absolute key cards in this matchup. Definitely. All right, there's another blue source. So Jace, Architect of Thought, goes to two since he's under no pressure, reveals Dissolve and a couple of lands. This is an interesting one for BBD. Yeah, I think... Uh he can just split the Dissolve and the two lands. It, it, his opponent's probably going to take the two lands, but the fact that your opponent doesn't have a Dissolve means that your connections only has to find one real threat mm -hmm. as opposed to having to find multiples. All right, Sittner did go ahead and pick up those two lands. He wants to keep that. The land drops flowing here, passes a turn back with his Jace Architect of Thought. Still online, still alive. And let's see what uh, Brian Bronduin can find here. He's drawn a lot of swamps. He's got an ultimate price in his hand. He's going to activate that Underworld Connections again, get another card. He finds a Desecration Demon with it. Not too bad. He can start applying pressure here. Definitely not the worst card he could have gotten. He's definitely just going to want a Hero's Downfall this Jace right away, though. Okay, so he wants to take care of Jace, make sure that that problem's solved, and just pass the turn back. Yeah, J Jace generates so much card advantage. You feel lucky just to get two for one or three for one, depending on what ended up happening. Night Veil Spectre off the top here for Brian. He's got a lot of options. He can actually play both Night Veil Spectre and a Desecration Demon with another land drop here. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely going to just be activating this Underworld Connections in every opportunity from here on out. He has found a Thought Seize. Target you, sir. So Sittner says, here's the Doom Blade that you know about. 
the other Doom Blade that you know about, a couple of Heroes Downfalls, and a Supreme Verdict plus a Godless Shrine. So, what does BBD take here, Jake? Um, I think it's it's between Supreme Verdict and Heroes Downfall, obviously. But I think you're just going to take a Heroes Downfall. It's an instant. Uh, Supreme Verdict does wipe the board, but he's going to have to kill anything you play anyway. So you might as well just take the instant that costs less mana. Okay. And here BBD can just jam a demon. I think that's probably the right play. And there it is, the demon that you just predicted a second ago, Jake. And it looks like he's going to be passing the turn back. And he's just really forcing his opponent to use that Supreme Verdict here in, the, in this turn or next, right? Definitely. Yep, and there it is, Supreme Verdict to take down the demon. But again, the grind is on here as that Underworld Connections is just going to keep churning away and f keeping Brian Brandwin's hand just completely full. What was that that he drew? I believe it was Erebos, God of the Dead. Oh, uh, okay. Going to draw another card. You mentioned it. He's going to be activating that thing every single turn for the duration of this game. He's down to 11, but under no pressure currently. Pay four mana to play Erebos. That resolves. And so it is Night Vale Spectre. All right, so nice recovery plan there for Brian Bronduin. He, he had some pressure with the demon. It got Supreme Verdicted away, and now he's got a lot of pressure, potentially drawing up to three cards per turn with that Night Vale Spectre in conjunction with his draw step and the Underworld Connections. Also, and many more, even. He can draw as many, well, not as many as he wants, but he could draw a ton of cards with his Erebos, though he still hasn't actually hit any life gain yet. He, he hasn't hit a... Um, a Grey Merchant yet? Though you got to figure he's going to hit one pretty quick here drawing this many cards per turn. Yeah, I don't think he's uh, going to have an issue hitting a Grey Merchant. He also knows that his opponent doesn't have the Aether Lane in his deck, so he can just safely go to one. It's not a big deal. He also just plucked a Supreme Verdict out of his opponent's hand and then played a Pack Rat. That's right. So here's a Pack Rat that's also going to turn Erebos on here. Yeah. So well, Erebos was already on. Oh, from the Underworld Connections? You're right, from Underworld Connections, you're right. Yeah, but uh, Brian Bronduin here can uh, discard two cards, uh, making two more pack rats. And, you know, he has plenty of cards in hand to spare because he has all these dead removal spells. And by discarding those two cards, each of those copies of pack rat actually gives give him a devotion. So he, uh, he makes the pack rat token, and then... So but an ultimate price takes down the original pack rat, or does it? Well, it's just going to become another pack rat now. That's right. So discard a swamp, make a pack rat. He's doing all this so that his Erebos stays active, is that right? Correct. Because if he lets it f become not a creature for even an instant, then it's removed from combat and won't be attacking? Correct. Right, so... All, these, uh, all this stack juggling just to make sure that he gets in that damage hit there to drop, drop Alex Sittner down to 13. And that's going to do it. Alex Sittner scoops up his permanence, and Brian Bronduin is up a game in the semifinals here from Grand Prix Louisville. Breakout deck here. I mean, man, breakout might, might not be the, re the, uh, the best word, but three players playing this exact 75 in the entire field of over 1,000 players, and all three make the top eight. Yeah, I think I think it was a pretty dominant performance. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, three friends showing up together, all from the top eighting a Grand Prix with over a thousand people. Update from the side table: John Stern up a game. Ah, up a game against the Mono Blue deck. That's right. I wonder if Pelucranos had something to do with that. The world may have been eaten. Absolutely, Again. can be possible. Take a look at our upcoming webcast schedule here, guys. If you, uh, if you love watching Magic, if you love joining us for all the, uh, the sweet tournaments that happen around the world, make sure you tune in for Grand Prix Antwerp, which is modern, October 26th and 27th, along with Grand Prix Valencia Theros Limited on November 9th and 10th. Those are both brought to you by our European coverage team. Then you can come watch GPDC if you're a big fan of Legacy, November 16th and 17th, along with... Grand Prix Albuquerque, and uh, that's going to be standard the following weekend, November 23rd and 24th. Grand Prix Vienna, standard, 
back in Europe. European team covering that one November 30th through December 1st. And we've got Grand Prix Dallas-Fort Worth, which again is standard, December 7th and 8th. Lots of standard coming up. Hey, people love standard. People do love standard. Yeah, they, that is the most popular format for sure. Definitely. I love standard. I play a lot of standard. You I'd do. say I play more standard than any other format, actually. Yeah, and you think about standard and you write about standard. Like, yeah, I do. You, you're, think about it a lot. You're a standard guy. No doubt about it. All right, so players are uh, going into the sideboards here. But, you know, you mentioned this earlier, Jake, about this matchup. And, yeah, post boardage uh, becomes an absolute and he's up nightmare. And he's Alex already up a game. Well, it's not like it's bad game one. <laughs> That's right. So, so what are we? What gets worse here for Alex? Um, so, in the post boarded games, Brian no longer has a whole bunch of dead removal in his hand uh, throughout the course of the game. Instead, his deck just becomes this streamlined machine. Mm. Um, he gets tons of discard spells. All of his cards interact. Uh, he has more copies of Erebos. He has more copies of Underworld Connections. Just every single card in his deck is a card that his opponent is going to absolutely have to deal with. Like Underworld Connections, if if there is not a Detention Sphere to immediately follow Underworld Connections, it can take a game over, as we've seen. And the same is true of Erebos, and the same is true of so many different cards in his deck. And the fact that he has Discard... It just makes is going to make it really hard because Alex is going to need specific cards to deal with each of the uh, disruptive elements from Brian Bronduin, and Brian Bronduin can just pick apart his hand and take whatever he has that deals with what Brian is going to present to him in terms of threats in the game. Okay, so let's say that Alex Sittner wins this next game. What does that game look like? And and I'm not I'm not talking about Brian Bronduin mulligans to four or anything. Or is that really what it comes down to here? Um, I think like how bad is this? I think depending on the draws, mm -hmm. um, Alex can win. I, one of the big things he can do is top deck an Aetherling. Okay. Um, when he has access to seven mana. Okay. Because there's not going to be as much removal in Brian's deck in post boarded games. That he having double downfall is going to be a lot more difficult when he's being pressured by planeswalkers and he doesn't have the other removal to back it up. And Aetherling is a threat that Brian really cannot deal with in any profitable way okay so situation would be like brian brown doing tears apart his hand but alex Sinder keeps hitting land drops brian takes a bunch of damage from his thought seizes and from his underworld connections and is trying to build up some type of a force to win the game and then alex manages to stick a uh an aetherling and, and attack him twice or whatever to finish him off yeah okay. maybe once yep okay i mean you got to think of the of the what it, what it would actually look like here, right? If you're sitting in Alex Sittner's chair to try to figure out, well, how am I going to win this? All right, I believe that Alex Sittner has kept, and BBD is taking a look at his hand here. And he's kept as well. So right away, Temple of Silence, keep that on top. Temple of Deceit, we've been here before. You know, this is interesting. Uh, Brian Brondewin has uh, Pithing Needle and Thought Seas in his opening hand. So he can wait, perhaps until turn two or turn three, mm -hmm. and then fire off that Thought Seas, get a look at Alex's hand, and then after he does so, uh, he can just Pithing Needle whichever threat it is that Alex has access to. Pretty nice. <laughs> like that combo. It's a nice one. This, this Swamp enters the battlefield tap because it's paying for a Thought Seas, and it's far and away Aetherling... Hero's downfall and three lands here. So not a ton of action in the early game here for Alex Sittner. And Brian Bronduin has to be happy to see a hand like this where maybe next turn if he has an Underworld connection, she can just run it out there and, and start getting value. Definitely. And something that Brian Bronduin is probably pretty happy about here is that he gets to take the Aetherling out of the game entirely for Alex Sittner. So that's... That's Alex Sittner's biggest route to victory in this matchup, and Brian Brunduin just ha put it in Alex's graveyard on the second turn of the game. Mm -hmm. And he's gonna actually name. He's actually gonna run Pithy Needle. So is this gonna name Jace? I would assume it's going to name Jace, and then he's what he's going to do by naming Jace here is preempt Alex's ability to. Uh, you know, just draw Jace and cast it. Because the problem, of course, from, from Brian Brondewin's side is that if he draws a Jace and casts it, he's going to get an activation off of it, and it's already kind of 
too late, right? I mean, you can you still want to take care of the Jace, but doing it preemptively means he doesn't get to activate it ever. Another thought, sees. You mentioned it, Jake. So brutal. Is he going to take the pithy needle here? Um, I think he's just going to go ahead and take far away. Okay. Because he has, what, a demon in his hand or something? Yeah. Okay. Because pithy needle naming underworld connections can get kind of ugly for the uh, near mono black deck there. Well, the pithy needle uh, can't is has to name whatever land the Underworld Connections is on. Oh, it does because it gives it to the... Sorry, yeah, so, I forgot about um, that interaction. No, so it's interesting. So Brian Brown Nguyen uh, is going to get to activate an Underworld Connections at least once before the Pithing Needle can even be played on Alex's side. And then once he does that, he, um, he can always just redraw another one. And it, it's not like it blanks the future Underworld Connections as Pithing Needle does against... So savage. ...the Jaces, so... All right, here it is, Desecration Demon. Draw step for Alex Sittner. And Supreme Verdict. So he got there. Takes the pressure off. These players are in the semifinals here in Louisville. And uh, they're playing to play for, for all of it. And this has got to be pretty happy for Sittner, right? I mean, a Grey Merchant for two is not exactly a blowout here. Definitely not. I mean, now Alex Sittner, like, if he... If he's able to find himself an Elspeth or another big card like that, he could, you know, do some serious work here on BBD. So that just attacking with Grey Merchant. Brian doesn't really have much action left. It looks like there's just a swamp in his hand. He has one other card, but I can't see what it is. Oh, it's, it's another, another Grey Merchant. Merchant. So he's going to run that out there and hit you for four. So he has managed to put some, some nice pressure here. He's got his opponent down to 12 with four power on the board, so a three-turn clock. But you've got to feel like Alex is going to find a way to uh, to not die to these two Grey Merchants. Yeah, I mean, it, you never know. They, they get there sometimes, but... Yeah. <laughs> Attack with both of them. Go down to eight, so... Plan A in accordance. Is this an? It is an underworld connections. What a great draw! It's pretty nice for Brian. Right when he ran turn. out of gas, he drew it, and now he's going to start drawing a bunch. He even drew a thought seize off of it, and the pithy needle goes away. <laughs> he's going to show an island. So right now, Alex Sittner in top deck mode, trying not to die to a pair of gray merchant of asphodels. No, this is not a limited grand prix, and that's going to do it. Yeah, Brian Brown doing into the finals here in Louisville. Very exciting for him. He's somebody who's wanted very badly to get on the Pro Tour for a long time. You know, this will be his second Pro Tour in a row. He was unable to get that 25 that he was really aiming for in Dublin. But a finals appearance here at the Grand Prix Heck, just maybe, the next weekend. Maybe he'll be holding a trophy. Yeah, maybe a victory. And now he suddenly finds himself in pretty good position to be on the train the Pro Tour next year. Good for him. So this is a big, big, uh, big performance for him. I think we're going to try to it's a huge jump deal over for him. to uh, to John Stern versus um, Beckstrom. Yeah, so uh, John Stern versus uh, was it Andrew? Who was Andrew playing? Beckstrom? There we go. BBD in there, and there's Andrew Beckstrom and John Stern. They're still battling. The last we heard, John Stern was up a game. Which isn't shocking. Not at all. As his deck can... It, 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 that happened quite quickly when we heard about it. And let's take a look here. So we have a Colonian Hydra, but it looks like it's on lockdown thanks to Tidebinder Mage. Now, these main deck Tidebinder Mages never been happier. Facing down the green-red deck of John Stern. Oh, definitely. And, I mean, that's one of the main reasons why the deck was so strong at the Pro Tour is because green-based mid-range decks were all the rage. And Tidebinder Mage is very, very good against those. That's right. And, I mean, people people play uh, Tidebinder Mage in these decks, even if they're not facing really any targets for it. And they don't even take it out, usually, because they need the devotion. But, man, in a, de in a matchup like this, that card just becomes awesome. It, it becomes one of the absolute very best cards available. John, looking like he has a few options here. Now, this is turn... 
four for John, I'm assuming. He's on the draw here after winning the first game. Correct. All right, so Boone Seder gets into the red zone. It looks like John has access to Mizium Mortars. Will he want to hold that, or does he want to fire it off immediately? Usually firing things off immediately is the correct play against the blue deck. You just need to contain them for those early turns. Okay. That's the most important thing you can do. That said, a kicked Mizium Mortars will probably wipe the entire board state, no matter what it is. And that's true. Of Andrew Beckstrom. So it is an interesting decision, like if he's if got he, maybe he a carry added here or something, and then yeah, the next turn like he, he can does. kick it. Okay, so... You know, if he has a land carry added, it's it's one thing. If he if he needs to draw an untapped land to make that happen, tough decisions here for John Stern. So let's see what he comes up with. It looks like he has two copies of mortars, so he can go ahead and mortars this Nightfall Specter. Okay, and then cast oh a Tusker. It's an interesting route. All right, very aggressive. The most aggressive lines. I like that, though. I, I like just turning a game into a race when you're playing against this mono blue deck. You have to remember that that's what they want you to... That's what they don't want you to do. Yes. They want you to attack their planeswalkers. They want you to attack all these other random things while they just peck away at you in the air. Yeah. And, and they want you to be too scared to use your removal on Tidebinder mages that aren't doing anything and Cloudfin Raptors that are one-twos and, you know... Yeah. But I like... I, I, we saw that at the Pro Tour as well. When people started to catch on on how to beat the deck, it was all about kill stuff. It, it just... Sure, it's a Frostburn weird like we see him played here. Just get rid of it. You know, and if you can keep them off of Devotion... Wow. Tidebinder Mage number two, so a big turn here for Andrew Beckstrom. And he's going to keep the Boon Seder locked down in addition to that Colonian Tusker as well. So... If he... If, if uh, John Stern does have another Mizium Mortars and he can manage to kick it it will completely destroy everything that Andrew Beckstrom has built up here. If he cannot, then it looks like those Tidebinder mages might keep things locked down. And a very real clock coming out from the Mono Blue deck here. That Clownfin Raptor now, a 3-4 flyer. Yeah. 3-4 flyers are... Pretty insane. They will close out the deal quite quickly Especially here. Especially when you only pay one mana for them. I'm hearing that uh, the Beckstrom's actually from Chicago, and it, his uh, his playgroup calls him Bike Storm. <laughs> Bike Storm. Bike Storm. I like it. All right. Stormbreath Dragon hits the red zone here. It's going to drop him down to 12. And that was a fifth land, of course, then as well. So do, did we get a look at his hand there, Jake, to see if he does have a second copy of Mizium Orders in it? I believe the what I thought might have been a second copy of Mizium Orders actually turned out to be a Stormbreath Dragon. Okay. So let's see what Andrew Beckstrom has for his turn. Surveying the board. In a great position here with this double tide biter mage draw. Unfortunately needs something to get that boon Seder off the table if he's gonna attack with those tide biner mages. Alright, another Cloudfin Raptor. But and then it looks like he's gonna activate his Nykthos here to create infinite mana and kick. I mean, overload a Cyclonic Rift, all of it back to your hand. He's going to use the rest of the mana to pump up. And he's going to hit you for 2, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It could be lethal, uh, unless he didn't have enough mana left over. Not quite. I'm assuming he's at 1 or 2. Yeah, it looks like he's down to 2 here. And that probably will do it here. Yeah, that should be Unless he it. goes land... Mizium orders. I mean, being up against double tie biter mage on the draw when you're a green red deck, not where you want to be at all. And I, I think you were right, Jake. I don't see any other any other red cards outside of that dragon in his hand. And sure enough, we're gonna get a game three before we find our second finalist here in Louisville. Things are gonna go back to John Stern. He's gonna be on the play. 
That's where he wants to be. He's the second seed coming into the top eight here. The number one seed coming in was Sam Black. He lost. He lost so to a very bad matchup. He did. It's Alex sitting there. 2 0. That means that John Stern is now the highest ranked player left. Or, excuse me, not ranked. The highest seeded player left in the top eight. And that means that he's, if he does get through, he will have the play against whoever it is. And we, we happen to know who it is, but he doesn't have to care. I think either of these players will have the, pair, the play in the finals, actually. Okay. Brian Braun Nguyen squeaking in in seventh or sixth. Finding his way into this top eight. Playing the mono black deck that really did take this tournament by storm. Jeez, oh, that's putting it lightly. I mean, all three players playing it top eight? That's incredible. I think there were actually five people in total playing the deck. Oh, okay. And four out of five of the people playing the list were in the top 16 of the tournament. Unbelievable. Uh, three of them in the top eight. And one didn't make day two. Okay. But, you know, it's a magic tournament. There is you know, some element of variance. <laughs> There's also something to be said for the skill level of the players who were playing the deck. Of course. You know, you have Brad Nelson, Brian Brondewin, and Todd Anderson, who are all incredible constructed players. Mm -hmm. And they all play a lot of Magic Online and play a lot in real life with their standard decks. They know how this format works better than most people do. It's so. true. John Stern, a lot of success this week in Gruul Aggro. Coming into the tournament, I thought that Gruul Devotion decks were going to be a dominant force this weekend, but I was proven wrong. Indeed. I still have faith in that deck, though. You, you still think it's a contender? Yeah, I still think it's, okay. like, the contender. I think it might take a little while for everybody to learn how to play the deck, but once they do... It's going to be a scary time for everybody. Watch out, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, Tidebinder Mage, super important in this matchup, as we've seen. Yes. Um, John Stern does have Mizium Mortars to interact with it, but if his opponent's drawing multiple Tidebinder Mages, then it's not going to be the most relevant thing in the world. Okay. Mizium Mortars, we talked about it in the first game. He used it to take down a, uh, a Night Veil Spectre, Spectre is what yeah. he ended up hitting with it. But we, we did note there that, you know, the, the, near the end of the game for the last couple of turns, if, if John had had enough mana to overload one, it would have completely crushed his opponent. You know, so that's something that we'll keep our eye out for as well. Yeah, and now... I you know, Andrew could have very easily had something like Master of Waves or Thassa in his hand. Which, by the way, we and didn't see either of. Yeah, we didn't he see either of He just kind of played hands. like a blue deck with creatures. <laughs> like, yeah, wasn't and while multiples of them were Tidebinder Mages, and he is playing against a red-green deck. So... Yeah. Still. He was playing two to mana Flame Tongue Cavers, <laughs> <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> Oh, John Stern. Uh, John Stern has some really powerful effects against the blue deck in his deck, too. Um, you know, Miscutter Hydras in his main deck. Those probably helped him out in game one when he was victorious. And now here he gets to be on the play again. And being on the play is going to be really important in a matchup that's so tempo-oriented like this one. So who do you like here? John Stern on the play? I'm going to say John Stern on the play. He's going to fight through these Tidebinder mages? I think he is. I'm with you. I also think Domri is pretty huge here. All right, so here we go. Game three, this is going to decide who meets Brian Brownduin in the finals of this Grand Prix here. Do we have some keeps? Assuming that John John Stern is in the tank here. He's trying to decide whether or not it's keepable. 
All right, it is. it is. Turn one Elvish Mystic. He does have to take two damage, which could definitely be relevant down the line. This is not one of those matchups where you can just take as much damage and not care about it. Uh, Cloudfin Raptor. All right, so each each player hitting their their one drop. There's the Sylvan Carry added off the top there for John Stern. But does he have a three drop? Namely, can he play a Domri raid and then fight that? Cloudfin Raptor here, potentially? That would be the absolutely ideal play. It doesn't look like he's going to have access to that play here, but he definitely has a few different options. All right, he's going to pass the turn back. So this signals to Andrew Beckstrom that uh, it's probably a Boon Seder in the future here. Yeah, one would assume that there's a Boon Seder about yeah, to hit Because otherwise he would have taken a damage from that Elvish Mystic. So let's see what the turn two play as well. It's a Muta Vault, so that's interesting. We know that we're not going to be seeing Tidebinder Mage to lock down that Elvish Mystic for the rest of the game. Or at least until it dies. And nothing. He just passes the turn back. So here's Boon Seder on end step. Now, is John Stern going to offer a trade here? Definitely. Muta Vault um, for Boon, Boon Seder, no problem? Yeah, when you're playing against some out of blue deck, you just you just want to trade as much as you can. Uh, Even for their the devotion decks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the lands, that, that's going to tie up their ability to just curve out on you. Okay. He's going to play a scavenging news first? Is that what's happening? No, the carry added first. Seems to make sense. Okay. Attack you with my Boon Seder. Tap it. Triton Tactics targeting my Muta Vault. Okay, so he tapped the Muta Vault to activate it. And he's going to play a Triton Tactics to block here. Interesting. Uh, Train tactics actually. It'll trade here. Pretty good here. Yeah, he's gonna get rid of the boon Seder unless uh, John has something else to do here. The Cloudfin Raptor doesn't have enough power to to take out the boon Seder, but the Muta Vault does. And the follow up play. Scavenging news, and John Stern passes the turn. I did see, by the way, that John does have a Mizium Mortars in his hand. Ooh, wow. So that I think he'll, here. I, I'm assuming that he'll want to try to play the longer game here. Yeah, I mean, assuming, uh, see, it's weird because Andrew does, is not building up a creature base. So you may just want to kill what he has. Mm -hmm. You know, take what you can get kind of thing. All right, so John Stern surveying the scene here. Just hoping to run over his blue opponent, who just has a 0-1 and a Muta Vault in play right now. All right, he's going to fire off a Miscutter Hydra here. And that's for great four. here. Another question, though, is he sending the scavenging noon? He, he does. And I think you want to. I mean, if your opponent blocks in the Muta Vault, it's clear they didn't have another blue source in hand to cast Night Veil Spectre because they would have. Right. And if he goes ahead and blocks that Muta Vault, then that's going to put him down to two lands. And he's already on the draw. He can't really afford to be that far behind when your opponent has a 4-4 protection from blue in there. That's right. Play. So, John, continuing to go work against these control decks. Yep, so Andrew Bex Beckstrom does trade off his Muta Vault here for the uh, potentially bigger scavenging news down the line. He finds his third blue source here, and what does he have? Well, he's got that Night Veil Spectre. That's going to evolve Cloudfin Raptor. Cloudfin Raptor is going to attack. It's a good one. And here we go. So we've got a race on our hands here. Can John Stern find ways to add to this race? He needs to find some something beefy. It looks like he's drawn a Elvish Mystic for the turn. That's not what he wanted. He might just want to fire off this. Uh, we saw this last time. He might just want to fire off this uh, Mizium Mortars to take down the Night Veil Spectre right now. Yeah, it's really important to keep your opponent off devotion in matchups like this. Nope. Hmm. He's going to wait. So he, he, he figures... 
I like the weight here. I, I don't think it's bad at all. His opponent's going to play something this turn that's probably going to die to Mizzia Mortars. He can One kick it so. and then just bash. He is going to let Night Veil vale Spectre hit him once. But, but realistically, a yeah, here. it's not a big deal. Like, the worst, worst case scenario, he hits a land, right? That's like the worst possible. And even if he hits a land, that's fine. I mean, he's struggling yeah. to make sure he's exactly. getting these land jobs. Both I'm just saying that's the are. worst. It's not that bad. Yeah. All right, so... Any land here from John will be enough from to Overlord of Mizia Mortars on the following turn. Oh, no, he already has enough to Overlord of Mizia Mortars next turn. So Andrew is going to need some really good stuff at this point. That Miscutter Hydra is a quick clock. It is. It's going to make just, short work of his life total. Yeah, and it's just going to keep hitting him over and over and over. Remember, Miscutter Hydra has protection from blue, so there's really not much. I mean, that Muta Vault can jump in the way once, but... He's going to keep falling behind. Here's a Tidebinder Mage to lock down an Elvish Mystic. This is okay. It could take him off of the mana. Not now, after. Yeah, so here we have a Tidebinder Mage, one of the very best cards for uh, Andrew coming down. And Night Vale Spectre heals a miscutter hydra off the top of john stern's library that's a shame for john stern he would have loved to have found that miscutter hydra <laughs> absolutely instead he finds well a mana source which i think he might have needed to to fire off a uh, mizium orders here if that is his plan and that must be his plan at this point yeah and here it is an overloaded mizium mortars so that's going to wipe the entire board for Andrew Beckstrom and clear the way, well, for an attack here, though. If Beckstrom really wants, he can throw that Muta Vault in front of the Miscutter Hydra, though. you got to figure he's really going to want to hope to draw his other Muta Vault so he at least has the potential for a trade down the line here. Yeah, one thing I've noticed is that when you're playing against the Mono Blue deck, Miscutter Hydras for three are significantly stronger than Miscutter Hydras for two, and Miscutter Hydras for five are significantly stronger than Miscutter Hydras for four, mm. simply because of the way that they battle against Muta Vaults. Even though it's only one more mana, it's actually a big gap. Yeah, it's a massive gap because a Miscutter Hydra for five against the Blue deck, if they're not applying a lot of pressure on you, by the time you can get to the mana to do that, it almost will always win the game on its own. Okay. It outraces even a Thassa that's played the turn after it, so. The Miscutter Hydra continually, continuing to rumble into the red zone, dropping Andrew down to eight. A two-turn clock here from John. Let's see what, let's see what Andrew finds. These players are battling for a finals bid here at the GP, and it's a Master of Waves which you would think would be super awesome, but it's kind of not as awesome here as it's only a 2-1 that's going to bring in one other 2-1. Yeah, I mean, it's still a fine card. It but is still fine. But it cannot block Miscutter Hydra, and it trades with the Elvish Mystics, mm -hmm. and that can't be where he wants to be in this game right now. All right, there's an elemental token. Draw step. I believe that was a forest. But right now, John Stern does have the upper hand in this game, and this game is all that matters at the moment. Both of these players are tied, and the winner gets to face Brian Brownduin in his mono black devotion deck in the finals of the GP. So, four mana tapped. What do we got? Pelucranos? Ooh. Ooh. Pelucranos. <laughs> he does have the additional three mana available too, so that he can actually just take out that Master of Waves, take out the Elemental, though we really need to do that right now. I would do it right now. You would just get it out of there. I would just get it out of there. It gets the creature off the table. It prevents your opponent from doing some sort of shenanigans with Cyclonic Rift when you try to monster it later. Ah. And, you know, if you just get this far ahead, your opponent's going to four. You have a 6-6 six, six and a 4-4 four, four protection <laughs> from blue on the battlefield. And a couple of 2-2s two as well. <laughs> yeah, it's... It uh, excuse me, a couple of 1-1s, one which, you know, represent half of his life total in and of itself. 
Yeah, this is it. I, I can see what you're saying for sure. Right away, yeah. yeah. It's tempting to get cute there, but putting yourself this far ahead. All right, here's another master of waves. But it's looking but like he's done on board anyway. Well, no, he he does have the. Uh, oh, he has the muta vault. The muta vault. So potentially a turn here, though. Does he actually have any outs? Remember, the muta vault's going to be dead, so there's not going to be a cyclonic rift being uh, overloaded here. And I think uh, John may just serve with both elves, Pelucranos, and the Hydra. Ship the team, man. Yeah. Get him in there. I like that attack a lot. Carry added wood attack if it could. <laughs> Everybody in. All right. Chump lock you here. Chump lock you here. And does he want to trade this master? Or is he just going to go down to two? Things looking dire for Andrew Beckstrom here. John Stern looks poised to make the finals of yet another GP for him and his team. What does he have? There it is, Boon Sater for the win. Fist bumps, and John Stern is into the finals. Pretty amazing stuff there. John Stern with his gruel, aggro-y mid-range strategy making it all the way to the finals, prepared to fight against Brian Braun Nguyen, playing mono-black devotion.